Okay, so I'd just like to thank the organisers for inviting me to give, uh, share this information with you. I've no idea. So um, this is just an overview of my talk. Um, I was asked to provide estimates of the numbers of people on PrEP across Europe, and it's very difficult to do that because we have a huge variety of data sources, and those data sources have very different levels of detail provided within them, very variable accuracy, and the way some of the data is collected, it's very biased uh, towards certain group. I'm also going to review the PrEP gap, prep gap. Uh, look a little bit about informal versus informal, formal versus informal PrEP and the implications that has where the missing people are, and a little bit about the community's role in provision of PrEP and how we've actually got to where we are at the moment. So one of the fast-track targets for 2020 from UNAIDS is to have 3 million people on PrEP globally. If you just do a direct proportional translation, that would be 300,000 in Europe by next year, and we're nowhere near that number yet. Um, when I'm talking about PrEP, obviously I'm just talking about tenofovir-based regimen, and with informal provision, this is either daily or event-based. It's important to remember with informal, within informal um, PrEP taking, there are a variety of different regimens people use, T's and S's, various other things like that which have not got an evidence base, we would recommend that not be used, but a lot of, uh, because of cost reasons, people are using them. So the way people access PrEP is also very different across the region. There have been a number of research trials, some of which are ongoing, and that's not an exhaustive list, that's just an example. In some places, it's provided within the government healthcare system, although not always with full reimbursement. And sometimes that's just around the cost of the drug rather than the actual tests related to it, or vice versa. There are various implementation uh, projects, demonstration projects and pilots going on, and I'll overview some of those. And also it can be privately sourced. So that can either be through a private clinic where you pay for your healthcare service or via online. And sometimes people mix that up with healthcare provision in providing HIV and STI screening as well. So it's a very mixed bag of provision. So the data sources that I've been uh, reviewing uh, have been including the ECDC Dublin Declaration, and that's where HIV focal points within each country fill out a questionnaire. So again, it's not hard data, it's people's estimations, although very experienced and knowledgeable about their country. Um, we've got some information directly from services uh, and colleagues and via program reports. Obviously within research we can monitor recruitment data so we get an idea about how many people are enrolled and also from community action, so asking the actual people that we're trying to target and get onto PrEP. So the Dublin Declaration, um, this was reported uh, this year in October, and Timoz Nouri from ECDC has just sent me yesterday an update um, to show that Spain and Ireland have come on board as well. So this is where PrEP is implemented, implemented in Europe. Uh, obviously, it's more in the West than the East. And I think going back slightly to the conversations we had about East versus West, I think it may be that different uh, who you are does matter, but it's how your country treats who you are. So as uh, if you're a gay man in Russia, you're going to have a very different experience than a gay man in the UK or undocumented migrants in, in different countries. So I think we have to maintain that East versus West because that's how we bring about political change. So this is where primary settings for the provision um, of PrEP occur, so mainly in ID clinics and STI clinics where it's uh, through programs and in private clinics where people are uh, obtaining it themselves on, online or privately. This just breaks down into the countries, uh, estimates per 100,000 um, of the adult population. And this just shows, again, that the West is uh, further ahead than the East, and the diamond, tri the diamond uh, shapes are where it is uh, first provision of PrEP. So where that data is available, apart maybe from Austria, most of this is just showing initial rollout, so most people are attending for the first time. People were also asked what the barriers are, and it would be no surprise to people that cost was the main one, either of the drug or the supporting healthcare requirements. <coughs> There's also concern around competency and people's knowledge and awareness of PrEP as clinicians to provide it to their, client, their patients. So looking a little bit at cost, this has been provided anonymously because it's commercially sensitive, but that's a huge range across Europe from over 800 to less than five euros. And interestingly, country A and country T are adjacent countries in Europe with very similar healthcare settings, but the different cost to them is huge. And at the moment, you can get um, private, privately prescribed, but um, 
via pharmacies in the UK cost 17 euros or 17 pounds, sorry, so that's like it's probably 17 euros now, um, <laughs> or, or less. Um, and in, in most cases, online prep is, is slightly cheaper. So it's a bit worrying that now that we have generic prep, the countries are paying that much a month to provide prep to their patients. So competency was a concern. Um, oh, I need to update this, because England did actually have guidelines in 2018. Um, so this is looking at where guidelines are. And it's quite interesting, isn't it? I don't know that there's any other any other a situation that's required guidelines where the guidelines in many countries have prece preceded provision of that actual uh, service. So that's something that's been really driven by community and particular um, clinicians who are champions for PrEP. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the countries in the West to give you an idea of the numbers we're talking about. The time periods vary a little bit, but we're still talking very low numbers if we're looking at, and this is where the, most of the countries we, most of the provision uh, is occurring. We're still at like less than 30,000 people and we need to get to 10 times that by next year. Uh, not surprisingly to many of you, the major vast majority are MSM. Um, Scotland has reported in its uh, report that their daily dosing is 74%. Um, that's slightly higher than, say, in France, but France started out mainly with IPAGAE and using event-based dosing, so I think probably culturally there's kind of, uh, within clinicians, they feel possibly more comfortable and uh, better at explaining that potentially. Wales is reporting a stop rate of 52%. That's phenomenally high considering they've only been going 18 months, so we need to look into that a little bit, particularly how they're reporting a stop rate. So patients aren't going to come in typically and say, I'm stopping, they're just not going to come back. So how long do you wait for them not to come back to say they've stopped? They may have been on daily and changed to event-based, and it's extended the period that they may not come back. Moving east a little bit, uh, Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova have uh, pilot studies going on for MSM and trans people in medical health care settings, but the UK, Ukraine is a mixed uh, model of delivery using uh, community as well. Their numbers are very small, but they have plans to expand those. Uh, moving slightly more central, so the uh, Central and Eastern European Network Group uh, asked all their clinicians, did they know about PrEP, was it recommended in their guidelines, did they have any barriers? So one of the main barriers, again, was cost, but also lack of guidelines. But starting to appear as a quarter of the doctors felt that it was stigma, they, they felt reasons of stigma or their, prob their issues around PrEP would stop them recommending it, and they thought concerns within patient groups would similarly protect, prevent people from using it. And certainly, that is still an issue within patient groups, um, and that's been recognised and starting to be addressed. So if we now move to asking the community, so this is the, game and sec uh, the MSM survey, uh, which was uh, covered in 2017 and recently reported. They had a large number of respondents. And this is showing uh, the number percentage currently taking PrEP daily or on demand and how that varies east to west. This is just breaking it down into the countries. And so an average 3% of people have, uh, are taking PrEP. Uh, and two out of three are opting for daily dosing, which is slightly less than what has been reported in Scotland. So they also ask people, how likely are you to take PrEP, regardless of whether they're taking it or not? And this shows that almost 45% were likely or very likely to take PrEP. Within this survey, they also asked uh, more objective uh, risk assessment, so number of partners, number of unprotected sex partners, use of chemsex, various things like that, to identify what they were calling need. So they correlated between want and need and found they're very uh, closely linked, which is no surprise to anyone who's done a PrEP trial, is people know they're at risk and put themselves forward, and they tend to be at the higher end of the higher risk. So what um, this group then did, they mapped out for each country the reported proportion, percentage of people using PrEP among these respondents, so a by sample, and then who said they would use it but weren't using it, and called this the PrEP gap. And within um, Europe, that PrEP gap is 17.4%. If we accept that 2.77% of adult male population are uh, men who have sex with men, and that wanting and needing correlates very closely, producing a 17.4% gap, that would suggest that we have a PrEP gap in Europe of 500,000 people. It's important to remember that's just in MSM, so that doesn't address women, heterosexual men, and trans people who are missing from this altogether. So it's published very recently, um, so you can got that reference there. ECDC also took a, um, a sur uh, undertook a survey with Hornet, 
looking at fairly similar things, and it's just been reported, and everyone should have received their um, country-level data, but they've got 12,000 respondents, slightly higher coverage, fairly consistent, consistent across 16, 17 at 10%. Um, interestingly, they asked, when, where did you obtain it? And more than half, 54%, obtained it from somewhere other than um, a formal method of uh, securing PrEP. And interestingly, a third of the people hadn't told their clinician that they were taking PrEP. So a similar thing, sorry, this has got a little um, do not share on social media for these next two slides, please. I don't know if anyone is tweeting, but um, just because it's not been published yet. So this was undertaken by Preps to I Want Prep Now, which are two websites in um, the UK who advise people, raise awareness and direct them to online purchasing of PrEP and PHE. It was a cross-sectional survey undertaken uh, over a very short period of time early this year. And importantly, the recruitment was via Grindr, but also through the mailing lists of these two websites. So it is a slightly biased sample towards um, people who might be obtaining it online. Um, they received responses from almost 2,500 people, vast majority MSM, 94% current users, and 75% on the daily regimen. And what they wanted to do was try and take the number of people we knew through programs and the impact trial were on PrEP, and then assign a proportion of all the people respondent and then apply that to national figures. So the ratio of people on a program to people of acquiring it informally and then attending clinic regularly or attending clinic ir irregularly was five to two to one. And so they uh, estimate that there's over 20,000 people accessing PrEP in some form in the UK. They then went on to ask people's health-seeking behaviour and health outcomes to see what impact acquiring it informally would have. And you would expect it to have more of an impact because the vast majority of people who are, performing, uh, who are acquiring it formally in, the U in England, uh, and this, isn't, this is across the whole UK, but the majority were England uh, on the impact trial where you have to come in every three months to get your drug. So in current users, so that's in everybody, 80% had had an HIV test in the last three months, and that dropped to 70 in those who were acquiring it informally. And you can see that pattern repeated across, num so you're advised to have four tests and four HIV screens in the last 12 years, and there's a difference, and clearly also an STI diagnosis. Now the advantage of attending every three months with an STI is you get diagnosed quickly, you get treated quickly. So I'd say what we don't need is the overall period of infectivity within these two groups. So you may be getting more STIs, but if you get them treated very quickly, you're going to be infectious for a lot less. So your risk of transmission is going to be lower. And that's another piece of work that we're trying to look at with the PHE at the moment. Concerningly, uh, the safety bloods are very underreported in those assessing uh, PrEP informally. And we know that we find a lot of undiagnosed hypertension, renal problems, people starting to access PrEP, or they do start getting uh, some renal problems. Not a huge amount, um, but in particularly uh, age-related. So that is concern that people are taking this without proper um, monitoring. And it's important to note that in the UK, GU clinics have been advised, and doctors have been advised by the GMC, that they should be providing all this uh, extra care for people who are, who are purchasing PrEP informally. But what about everybody else? So that's all about MSM. Um, there is a, a lot of work going on, but at the moment it's had little impact. So WAVE has got the Women Against Viral, uh, in, viral Infections in Europe, and they've got a session, a big trip session on tomorrow, which is looking at some aspects of PrEP. The SOFIA Forum in um, the UK has produced a really good uh, leaflet for women. It's translated, it's had input from uh, white heterosexual women, women uh, of colour, trans women, sex workers, adult entertainment, adult entertainment industry. So people feel that it does speak to all those groups. Um, and it's been translated and they're available online if anyone's interested in. Um, there's a great uh, program that's been launched, Prep and Prejudice, and I noticed there's a poster outside, so I'd strongly encourage you to go and have a look at that. And they're developing some great resources for black African communities in the UK. And Clinic Q has had a huge success in recruiting trans women into the IMPACTS trial. So at the moment, we're, the IMPACT trial is about uh, less than 4% women. Half of those are trans women. And I think it's probably one of the first studies ever, it's actually slightly more than half that trans women are overrepresented within an underrepresentation, if that makes sense. But they are um, 
and I think it really reinforces the fact that if people who usually have difficulty accessing healthcare are accessing a health service that they know and trust, and they um, believe and uh, that people are accepting of them, and people make extra effort to include them in research trials, they really respond when it's a research trial that is actually uh, delivering something that they need and want. There's also some resources online. And there's a pan-European uh, movement called PrEP in Europe. They've just recently had a summit in Warsaw, and that all the presentations are online on their Facebook page. And it just that's just really to highlight that I've kind of mentioned mainly UK-based things where I know more about it. But in every country, there are these groups that are coming under this umbrella to work towards providing PrEP for everyone. And that's certainly the case in the UK, where a lot of disparate uh, community groups have come together to try and uh, bring political pressure on provision of PrEP in England, which it, where it's not at the moment available in the health service. Um, so uh, just to conclude, uh, it's, PrEP is being upscaled, but not nearly fast enough, and certainly more in Western compared to Eastern Europe, and almost exclusively in MSM. Access is by, by a variety of methods. Uh, formal rollout has been slow. Data and surveillance is patchy and a variable quality, and we haven't even really come up with all the terms and definitions we need yet. For example, stop rates. I think there is significant informal use, um, and that has less robust monitoring, but that's people have been driven to that because they can't get it provided by their government. What we don't know is the impact on HIV acquisition and the emergence of resistance on increasing informal use, but to date, for, through the formal programs, they've both been low, but if people are using it informally, we really have no way uh, until they come in to find out that that is uh, of concern. And clearly the impact on STI transmission is also of concern. So certainly what we need in the future is to increase the uptake in MSM, raise awareness. It's difficult in countries where that is being MSM is stigmatised, let alone risk being at risk of HIV or taking PrEP within your community as well. We need to urgently address the lack of coverage in other groups across Europe. We need to engage and support clinicians to ensure that they are providing uh, information and awareness to their patients and to ensure that their uh, concerns or thoughts or stigmatisation of PrEP doesn't influence the, what they provide to their, the people approaching them for care. We very much need to have a joint uh, approach with community because it's community who are going to be raising awareness, supporting, advising people on PrEP. Uh, and we need an integrated model. So people who won't come, if, if we just provide it in, for example, STI clinics in England, we know black and minority ethnic women who uh, end up becoming HIV infected have not been attending GU services, which is where that intervention would be provided. So we need to look at different models of delivering. And we certainly need a standardised monitoring tool for PrEP surveillance, including the emergent drug resistance. So ECDC, as always, uh, are picking up some of this, and they've arranged an expert group in January, February next year to produce guidance. And also the RESPOND consortium, which is led by Jens Lundgren in Copenhagen, have started a trial called PREPARE, which is where people who are diagnosed with HIV, if they've ever taken PrEP, are asked to fill in a questionnaire. Their clinician fills in questionnaires. We're uh, capturing resistance tests and also dry blood spot tests for drug testing if they've taken PrEP in the last eight months. So that's just a snapshot. I think if we took MSM out of the picture, it would all go very, very light green. So clearly there's a lot of work that needs to be done because we really need to be black by the time, um, by next year which probably won't happen, but we're working hard at it. So I'd just really like to thank Timor Nouri from ECDC who provided a lot of these information and all the other people who provided me with their data. Thank you.